The goal of this video is to introduce the idea of relative extrema, critical numbers, and to introduce Fermat's theorem, a useful result for helping you find relative extrema. So we'll start with a simple challenge. Try to draw the graph of a continuous function that has a relative maximum. Now, however many, try, however many times you try to do this, you should find that one of two things has to happen. If we call the argument at which you get your relative maximum c, you'll find that either f prime of c has to be zero at your relative max, or f prime of c does not exist. There's really no other way for you to fiddle around with a continuous graph to get a relative max without one of these two things happening. And that is indeed the content of what we call Fermat's theorem. Yes, that's the same Fermat. No, it's not that theorem. So we're going to be able to sort of give a nice proof of this in the time it takes to do this video. So if the function f has a relative extreme c, then either f prime of c equals zero or f prime of c fails to exist. That is the content of Fermat's theorem. Please note that this theorem uh, refers to an extremum generally. That could either be a max or a min, so it applies to both maxima and minima. Please notice also that there's really nothing in this theorem that uh, demands that f be continuous. So this, this theorem is going to apply to functions that, either, that are either continuous or otherwise. So, First, we're going to make a definition. We're going to define a critical number, or we could call it a critical argument, of a function f to be a number c for which either f prime of c is 0 or f prime of c fails to exist. So you can tell from this definition that we're going to care so much about these arguments that we're giving the whole class of them a special name, critical arguments. Now, with this definition, Fermat's theorem becomes much easier to state. If the function f has a relative extremum at c, then c must be a critical number of f. Or, if you'd like to put it another way, every relative extremum of a function occurs at a critical number. If you like this other version of the, uh, the synonym, you could say every relative extremum of a function occurs at a critical argument. So what does a proof of Fermat's theorem look like? So we'll just sort of map out a proof. Suppose f has a relative max at the argument c. So we'll draw a graph here where we have a relative max at the argument c. We can build our open interval, our sampling interval, and we notice that c is in the interval. And for every x in i, the interval f of c is greater than or equal to f of x. So we're going to put this picture off to the side. And what we want to do is we want to analyze the secant slope f of x minus f of c over x minus c for a couple different cases. Here's our sampling interval. And we'll notice that no matter what x we choose inside the sampling interval, f of x is less than or equal to f of c. That's because it's a relative max at c. Well, we're just going to rewrite this a little bit. f of x minus f of c is less than or equal to 0. All right. Now. Suppose x is greater than c. So it's just like the case we've got pictured in the right-hand corner. x is to the right of c. In this case, we know that the numerator of our secant slope has to be less than or equal to 0. We also know, since x is greater than c, that x minus c has to be positive, has to be greater than 0. So what happens when you divide something that's less than or equal to 0 by a positive number? You get a quantity that's less than or equal to 0. So what we'd like to do now is sort of picture what's going on here. This quantity, this secant slope, is less than or equal to 0 whenever x is to the right. So let's imagine that we're trying to take the limiting value of the secant slope as you approach c from the right. So in other words, you're looking at all these secant slopes from the right. Well, you'll notice that, as we have just proved, all those secant slopes have to be less than or equal to 0. What's the consequence of this? If that limit from the right exists, then the limit itself has to be less than or equal to zero. There's no way to get a positive limit out of a function whose values are always less than or equal to zero. All right, that's sort of half the battle. So let's imagine now moving over to the other side. This is going to look very similar, but we're going to get a different result. If x is less than c, 
Now we still have a numerator in our secant slope that's less than or equal to zero, but this time x minus c is negative. So we're gonna take a quantity that's less than or equal to zero divided by a negative quantity and that's gonna flip the sign. The secant slope in this case has to be greater than or equal to zero. And that's pretty obvious from a picture. If you were to look at the limiting value of secant slopes from coming from the left, then all those secant slopes you can build have to be greater than or equal to zero. What's the upshot of this? If the limiting value as you approach c from the left exists, then that limit has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we have these two cases. Depending on whether you come from the right or the left, your limiting value has to be respectively less than or equal to zero or greater than or equal to zero. Now, that's a pretty big deal because if the flat out limit exists, then of course it has to equal both the limit from the right and the limit from the left. But one of these has to be less than or equal to zero and the other one has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if the limit exists, it has to simultaneously be less than or equal to zero and greater than or equal to zero. Well, there's only one way that can happen. If the limit exists, then the limit actually has to equal zero on the nose. All right, that's by far the hardest part of this. Now it's just some logic. What have we proved? Well, if you look at a limit, it either exists or it doesn't exist. Forget about what the application for this limit is. It's true that the limit either exists or it doesn't exist. And what we just proved is that if f has a relative maximum at c, and the limit exists, then of course the limit has to be zero. So that means either f prime of c is zero, or in the other case where the limit doesn't exist, f prime of c fails to exist. That's exactly the content of Fermat's theorem. If you have a relative max at c, then c's gotta be a critical number. Now you could redo this whole proof with minimum swapped in for maximum, and that'd be a good exercise to imagine how that plays out, but it's gonna look very, very similar. So Fermat's theorem tells us that each relative extremum occurs at a critical argument. What if we looked at the converse of that statement? In other words, we're gonna switch around the order of the implication. Is it true that each critical argument is the site of a relative extremum? Well, you should think about this carefully. You should be able to refute it on your own, but let's just make up an example. Here's a function, and it's got four critical numbers, c1, c2, c3, and c4. And the derivative does not exist at c1 and c2 because they're sort of sharp, broken points. And then the derivative value is zero at c3 and c4, so those are critical numbers also. What we want to do is sort of imagine where the relative extrema are. What's the location of the relative extrema? Well, it's pretty clear we have a relative max at C2, and it's also pretty clear we have a relative min at C4. Now, please remember that the way we've defined relative extrema excludes endpoints from the discussion because you can't sample in a neighborhood of an endpoint. So there's no way to look at function values beyond the domain there. So endpoints do not count as relative extrema. So there are really only two relative extrema. Now what about these other two critical numbers? Look at C1. Just to the left of C1, the values are smaller, and just to the right, the values are higher, so that's not a relative extremum. Similarly, the values to the left of C3 are slightly higher, and the values to the right are slightly lower, so that's not a relative extremum either. So neither of those critical numbers are relative extrema. What's the upshot? Look at that list. Every relative extremum is a critical number, but not every critical number gives you a relative extremum. Now you can make explicit examples pretty easily. Here's the cubing function, x cubed. The derivative is 3x squared. Where is that zero? Well, it's pretty clearly zero when x equals zero, and that's where the tangent slope is flat. It's zero, it's horizontal, but it's not a relative maximum. So here's a case where zero is a critical argument of f, but the function f has no relative extrema at all. In particular, zero is not the location of a relative extremum. So what have we learned? Every relative extremum occurs at a critical number, but not every critical number yields a relative extremum. Now we're going to end with this example, and it's really as much um, an example of how to organize your algebra as it is the topics we've just discussed. But here's a function, x to the 2 thirds power times x minus 2. Now you should convince yourself that the domain of this function is all real numbers. You can take the cube root and square it for any real number x. So this, this uh, has domain all of r, 
and we're going to ask the question, where are the local extrema? Well, according to Fermat's theorem, if you really are interested in answering this question, the question you should first ask is, where are the critical arguments? That'll give you a list of candidates for local extrema. If you can find the places where the derivative is either zero or undefined, that'll give you your complete list of candidates for the local extrema. So we're going to take this function and we're going to find its derivative. Now there's a product, so let's use the product rule. We'll break out the product rule, x to the 2 thirds times the derivative of x minus 2 plus the derivative of x to the 2 thirds times x minus 2. This derivative is just 1. And we can use the power rule to find the derivative of x to the 2 thirds. So here's our simplified formula. Now you might be sad that there's a fractional coefficient. And so let's fix that. Let's actually factor one third from both terms. And you could ask yourself, uh, well, how am I going to factor a third? There's no there's the coefficient, there's one. Well, it's kind of easy. Just write x to the two thirds as one third times three times x to the two thirds. One third times three is just a fancy way of writing one. So that's obviously true. And then one third times three x to the two thirds. There's your factorization. So we're gonna be able to pull out a factor of one third and we're gonna get this quantity. All right, so far so good. Now, if the two thirds uh, coefficient made you sad, then you're certainly not gonna be very happy about these fractional power functions. So let's try to play a similar game. Um, x to the negative one third is the lower power. So let's see if we can factor x to the negative one third from both terms. And once again, we ask the question, how do you factor x to the negative one-third from this term? So we're going to write x to the two-thirds as x to the negative one-third times x to the third times x to the two-thirds. Because x to the negative one-third times x to the one-third is a very fancy way of writing just one. So these two quantities are equal. And now you can combine the two right terms in this product. Of course, x to the one-third plus two-thirds is just x to the one. So happily, x to the two-thirds is equal to x to the negative one-third times x. Totally worth it when you factor out the x to the negative one-third. Look at what you get. We can clean this up quite a bit. Of course, the insides of the square brackets just um, simplify quite nicely into 5x minus 4. And the x to the negative one-third could be written as 1 over x to the one-third. So we have this very nice formula for f prime of x. And now we ask ourselves, where are the critical arguments? In other words, we break this into two pieces. Where is f prime undefined? And where is f prime of x equal to 0? Those are the two questions we have to ask. Where is f prime undefined? Well, the only trouble we're going to get is if we try to plug in 0 for x, because then we would take the cube root of 0 as 0 in the denominator. That's trouble. So f prime of 0 is undefined. In other words, f has a critical argument at 0. Now, what about all the other arguments? Well, notice that f prime of x is well defined for every other value of x. So in other words, if, as long as you don't choose x equals 0, this formula is actually well defined. So if you really want to be highbrow about this, you could say the function f is differentiable on the set of all reals except 0. So that's the only spot, x equals 0, where we're going to get the derivative to be undefined. So the only other question is where does the derivative value equal zero? Now this term in front can never be zero. It's one over something, so it's going to be non-zero. That leaves only this term. And the only way this can be zero is when x equals four-fifths. So what do we know? f prime of four-fifths equals zero, and f prime of zero is undefined. Every other spot in the domain of this function is going to give you a derivative value that's well-defined and non-zero. In other words, our set of critical numbers is just the set 0 and 4 fifths. Those are the only two critical numbers. So there are critical numbers. Those are the candidates for relative extrema. We don't yet know their relative extrema. Now there's more sort of analytic analysis we could use pencil and paper and just try to crank through and figure out whether or not these are extrema or not. I want to sort of fast forward and just get to the punchline. And the way we'll do that is we'll just plot a graph of this function. Take your favorite graphing utility. You'll get a graph that looks like this. And you'll notice that at 0, we do indeed have a relative maximum. And at the argument 4 fifths, you do indeed have a relative minimum. So there you go. Both critical arguments in this example happen to correspond to relative extrema.